Hey guys, and welcome to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report, the first podcast to bring you the local fishing report, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. I'm back uh, joined today with my trusty co-host, Captain Patrick Garmus with Ugly Fishing. How are we doing today, buddy? Oh, Bush, I'm doing fantastic. It's uh, been, uh, been fishing a lot. Weather's been decent. Man, can't complain. It's, I bet it was uh, nice on the water today. I bet it was slick. I was jealous. Dude, you said yeah, you were fishing this morning. It was, it was nice. Had a um, had a group from Connecticut. They wanted to get a couple kids out on the water. We went out and targeted redfish. You know, the thing I like about targeting redfish with kids is a lot of times you don't have to make really you don't have to make these really super long casts and try to get way away from the boat. Yeah. Um, you you can get out of having all this super stealth mode and all this stuff in the in the works. And when you catch even a sixteen incher he'll pull a little bit of drag and oh they're gonna fight for sure yeah kids have fun and so then when you catch a 24 25 inch redfish and it pulls them all around the boat a couple times (laughs) it's a lot of fun i bet you know they they remember a 24 25 inch redfish for sure got them hooked uh, gotta get them hooked at a young age yep yep and we actually i had one kid man he was uh he was literally sitting there holding his uh holding his line in the water as i was moving the boat forward and a redfish came up and grabbed it right i mean literally shrimp was hanging in the water beside the boat so that's awesome my kid will be talking about that for years oh yeah it was a blast i like to say in uh what is it get your kid hooked on fishing he'll never have any money to get into trouble (laughs) (laughs) it's about right there's a lot of truth to that for sure. Absolutely, man. All right. Well, this week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report is brought to us by the Coastal Conservation Association of Alabama. Are you looking for an enjoyable night out and want to see all of that money spent on c- conservation efforts within Alabama? Check out the CCA's 20th Annual Lower Alabama Chapter Beach Party. This event will be held on April 26, 2019 at the Wharf in Orange Beach, Alabama. It starts at 6 p.m. and there will be a live auction, silent auction, a raffle, Dinner by Villaggio and live music by Wes Loper. Pre-sale tickets are discounted to one hundred and ten dollars per couple and seventy-five dollars for a single. Each includes a one-year CCA membership, dinner, and drinks. Tickets will be available starting March fifteenth, so they're available now at ccaalabama.org. Should be a fun event. Man, I really enjoy those CCA events. I mean, it's a good excuse to for me and a wife to have a little date night, and yeah. also, you know, we're knocking out two birds with one stone. We get the date night. We get some good food, get some drinks, get some entertainment, get For to sure. talk fishing and be around a bunch of people that are interested in fishing. They, I can't speak this about every CCA chapter, but our chapters around here are really putting a lot of money back into these reef programs and stuff. So oh, yeah. if you enjoy out being out there fishing and, and catching fish on these on these reefs, man, you got to support the CCA Alabama and, and get some of that money coming back into what, what you enjoy doing. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's right. a pretty cheap date night, too. It's not bad. Yeah, it's not bad, not bad at all. Not bad at all. All right, man, you guys had a ACFA meeting last week. Were you able to make it? And then we talked to yeah. Mr. The Pier. Yeah, I made it out there. We had uh, Bobby Everscott was our speaker, and um, they threw him a curveball. They asked him, they said, hey, we want, we want to know a little bit more about your deep water fishing and structure fishing and stuff like that. So he went into the details of the slip cork in and and carolina rigging and split shot fishing and you just fishing a lot of uh, a lot of the deeper water stuff and um mm-hmm. it's a little bit a little bit early to have that discussion in my opinion uh yeah. but it was uh man as a pile of good information i mean if you if you go there and, and listen to bobby and he had his diagrams on the big screen and stuff he said it was said it was out of his element to not have his little flip chart that he used to use and, right uh, but anyway, it was a it was a good seminar. We had a big crowd. It's certainly worth attending if you're interested in inshore fishing. Go there at least once, check it out. But sure. more than likely, you're gonna you're gonna sign up and want to be involved moving forward. Yeah, I did. I went uh, my first my first one last year, maybe a little earlier than this, and I did. I, I signed up my after my first meeting. It was a good 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 group of guys and people that want to share knowledge, and that's pretty cool. Yeah, it really is. There's another meeting on what May second. Yeah, May second, and uh, Moe's downtown. Then, yeah, then the third tournament of the year will be will be uh, that May fourth, and that'll be a speckle trout only tournament. Whenever I was in the club, when back whenever I was president and vice president, we used to have these um, competitions 
amongst the other fishing clubs and the other fishing clubs haven't survived the years. And um, so then we started doing kind of an internal speckle trout challenge about amongst the uh, older folks and the younger folks called yeah. it the old salts, young guns tournament. <laughs> um, I, like I, I think that's what they're still doing. But anyway, I'll still be representing the young guns. Hopefully, uh, I'll have to take a look at my schedule, see if I'm off. And if I am, I'll be helping trying to bring the the, the, uh, the, bring the title home. Yeah, bring the title to the young guns. The <laughs> old guys have been beating us year after year. It's been it's been about two or three years since the, since the young guns have brought home a win. Uh-oh. Well, maybe it's, this year will be the year. time. Yeah, definitely time. All right, man. Well, let's uh, let's get into this thing. Let's head on down to get our first report. We're going to head on down to Orange Beach, Alabama, and see what Angelo DPL has got on the offshore side. What's up, Angelo? So what's going on down there around Orange Beach? Man, you, you can see everybody putting the riggers on their boat. If they hadn't been fishing yet, they're they're getting ready to go. Uh, well, we have like an 80-degree day here today in, 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 the, in the Gulf Coast. It's hot. So. Sure. It's hot. And Patrick, like you were saying earlier, water temperatures are going up. This warm weather is just kind of kicking off the, the spring pattern. It's kind of really just now happening. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So what are some things, what are, what are y'all seeing down there this week? And, uh, and what do you think uh, uh, coming up? We talked about the fish report last week. And, you know, obviously we've had pretty bad weather as far as fishing goes, either rain and wind or rain and wind, whatnot. So there's not been a lot, a lot of good windows to go off of. Buddies of mine were out there. They went fishing the Kika, Thunder Horse, Thunder Hawk, all that stuff in that area. Put together a nice box of fish. I mean, they had about 10, 12 yellow fins. They weren't monsters, 30, 40 pounders, had a nice 20 plus pound dolphin. Did some deep dropping on the way in, caught some nice tallfish, had a big old nice Warsaw, a nice mixed bag of fish for an overnight trip and just kind of picked away and grinded away at the fish, caught everything on the chunk, caught some at night, caught some during the day. Uh, and that just got me thinking, you know, about how you need to, how people should be fishing this time of year and how do you put together a nice box of fish when they ain't exactly jumping in the boat. Yeah, for sure. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Patrick Ivey was talking about, you know, right now a good spring pattern is just to go find the bait, whether it be on top or on the bottom machine and just camp out on it. Did that, uh, did that tie in with your guys that were fishing? Yeah, exactly what happened. Found a rig, had some bait, marked some fish, and just stayed with it. And then they they turned on and they started catching them. And then, you know, lo and behold, they're sitting there chunking. Dolphin swims up in the chunk line. They got a spinning rod ready. Flip it a bait, put that in the boat. And, uh, you know, they, they kind of quit fishing earlier th- that morning when the bite kind of shut off. And then started packing it in and heading, heading up the hill and kind of stopped off at some rocks along the way and caught a few bottom fish. So about eight guys on the boat, they had... I had a nice load of fish for everybody to take home. Sounds cool. like with that many yellowfin, a big dolphin, and some tallfish and some grouper, I would say they got a pretty good freezer full. Yeah, that's, that's a nice, oh, that's yeah. a nice trip. Oh, man. yeah. Angel, I want you to go back and talk about the um, the spinning rod that they had set up. Give us some details on, you know, maybe what what they had set up and what, you know, what allowed them to be able to capitalize on that dolphin and maybe a couple other tips that – or maybe some rigging to have ready whenever you leave the dock to be ready for kind of at a moment's notice for some of those arrivals around the boat like that. So Patrick, I'm not sure if your wife's like this, but my wife is like this. Like I have tons of rods and reels. I've got a rod and reel for every situation. She's like, she doesn't understand why I have it. Well, the reason I have it is, is because this time, well, really any time of year, I think that kind of leads right into our tip of the week is that you have to be ready for those situations. Those little abilities to capitalize on a hand you're dealt is, are the difference between a good trip and a, ba- a bad trip or a good trip and a great trip. So they had a spinning rod with a little circle hook on it just in case something hit, it comes swimming up the chum line. They had, a, they, had a, they had a spinning rod with a popper on it. This time of year, we're going to start seeing the flying fish move in as this water temperature picks up so 
when you have that, you're going to start seeing tunas and stuff blowing up on those at night. Well, sometimes those fish are there for an instant and gone for an instant and gone just as quick. If you're able to capitalize one, two fish usually makes the trip. They had some electric reels on the boat. They were able to come in and deep trot for a little while, put a few more good fish in the, in the box. I mean, when you think, when I looked at their box, if you took away two, three tunas, took away their bottom fish, took away the dolphin, it would have really been a kind of a mediocre trip. Mm-hmm. But when you, when you loaded it all up into two, two of those big giant black wheel bears, you're like, dang, you guys had a really good trip. Yep, this time of so, year, man, that's what it's all about. It's grinding. You've got to grind it out. Grinding. Mm-hmm. Have everything ready. Like, I always like, even if I'm tuna fishing and I'm not, like, out there trying to catch a blue marlin, well, periodically, while you're out there tuna fishing, boom, one just shows up behind your boat. Don't let that be the opportunity that you got to go crimp on a hook and right. you gotta be ready. dig through your tackle. Got to be ready. Be ready. And then, you know, the difference in a fisher a trip of a lifetime and just another everyday trip is your preparedness. And so I think if you're prepared to take advantage of, uh, of the hands you're dealt, you're quite often put a, put a great trip together. I mean, I don't know. I could go on for days on stories that big fish shows up behind the boat and we, we end up catching it or we don't. And I don't know. I don't remember any of the ones we don't, but I damn sure remember <laughs> the ones that we did. That's a fact. Those those are the good stories though. Um, so I am I've never caught a blue marlin. I've I've don't do any of the offshore stuff. Give me just a just a quick rundown of what the emergency blue marlin rig looks like. For me, I like an eighteen o twenty o eagle claw circle hook. I like it snailed where the hook bends back towards into your leader, so you're coming in from the front eye of the hook and go into the back and that's going to cause the hook to bend back towards your leader and uh already go ahead and have a piece of floss on there and either a dart to dart your bait or uh the needle just to rig it up real quick i mean sometimes you don't even or just have the hook ready i mean sometimes when they show up behind your boat and they're all lit up because they're chasing something else it don't take that much sometimes they'll just come up and eat a dead bait you know right behind your boat Oh, so, yeah. If he's back there, yeah, for swimming, I'm not going to take time to bridle one. I'm going to hook him through the nose and wish him good luck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here you go, buddy. That's Hasta right. La Vista. Nice yeah. knowing you. Here's lunch. Very, very cool. You got a listing of the week or what you got going on over there on your real estate page? Man, we do. We just, we're, we're, we're putting it in the system right now. You know, we were talking before we got on the air and I said, you know, if the weather was like it is right now, our real estate values would probably be double what they are. I mean, just, Low humidity, nice sunny day out here today. Brand new listing, 2-2 condo at Walker Key. Tons of people from Mobile and Baldwin County all own second homes over there. It's one of those places that actually has a really good, uh, a cool vibe and a community feel to it. It comes with a deeded boat slip, two pools, two covered parking spaces, 335 is what we're going to list it for. It should sell quick, completely furnished. Anybody can go to uh, my Facebook page, Angela D. a Realtor, uh, and pull it up and take a look at what we got. Probably be have the pictures up on it tomorrow. Awesome. So, uh, nice. great deal, great property. Somebody's going to get a good deal on it. Sweet, man. It's that time of year. Got to get your summer digs figured out for sure. It is. It is. I mean, it is that time of year. And, uh, shoot from there it's a straight shot out the pass for sure. uh, so it's a pretty sweet spot nice. right across the street from sam's bait and tackle go get you a biscuit in the morning that's right all right angelo as always man we appreciate you giving us the offshore report and i'm sure we'll talk to you soon guys i appreciate it i enjoy being a part of the show and y'all have a great day see you angelo all right, later. all right captain patrick i like to hear those offshore reports i like the dolphin i'm getting pretty fired up about those i've uh, i've caught a couple of chickens We've never caught any big bulls or big cows or anything like that. Um, yeah. Man, it's crazy when they uh, when they get on like that. I got so, a video that I'll send you. We uh, got on a big old grass patch, and man, there's just thousands of them in the water from one of our nice. offshore trips not too long ago. Man, I heard a little birdie told me that you caught a pretty nice fish a couple weeks ago. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, man. Um, got the uh, pending state record sheep's head and. Uh, it was just a cool situation. I had um guy that worked used to work with my wife. He chartered me 
he wanted to go out. He, he told me this was the criteria for the fish trip was that he wanted a big fish to take a picture with. I was like, well, there should be some nice sheephead on the rig still. Yeah. And we, it's a very good chance that we come across some bull reds, uh, either on the way out or on the way back. And, uh, we headed out, did not see any red fish, uh, went sheephead fishing and, um, landed that big beast. He was hooked up. Ended up catching one whenever I hooked up. And um, anyway, it was a pretty special moment, man. He was yeah. like, he was as thrilled or more thrilled than <laughs> uh, than I was. Like, I was excited, but it was almost like. Um, I'm sure it was kind of surreal. Like a, a real surreal moment, man. Yeah. I'm sitting there looking at this fish. I put it on the, I put it on a digital scale and it was, it was bouncing from like 13 pounds uh, six ounces was the lowest it went and the highest it went was, uh, was like 14, three, you know, being on a bumpy boat. And I was like, that's the freaking state. If this is, if this scale is accurate, I am holding the state record sheephead. Man, that's awesome, dude. That's exciting. Well, we'll, uh, we'll stay tuned off. I think you're doing an article on in great days outdoors, getting the, we're getting the full exclusive on that. Yeah, yeah. Joe and I have to. Uh, we're we're going to get together here pretty quick and Sweet. put put it all together. Awesome, man. Can't wait to hear about that. All right, Patrick, let's head on down to uh, probably your favorite segment of the show. Let's see what the inshore is going on. We'll see what Captain Bobby Abrascado has been doing. What you say, Captain Bobby? What's hey, up, Bobby? guys. How y'all doing, man? Thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. Thanks for coming on. It's a beautiful day. <laughs> Yeah, it is, man. I'm telling you, it was a beautiful day, man, from, from well before daybreak to well into the trip. And, uh, you know, I think we're going to get through the part of the weekend anyway with a decent, decent, some decent weather. But, um, you know, the good news is the water's, water's pretty. And, and I don't think, hopefully, we're not going to get enough rain, more rain upstate to screw anything up, up in the bay. But the point, uh, everything down south is still going to stay pretty, regardless of what happens over the next couple of days, weather-wise. What you been up to? What's been what's been hot? Well, I will tell you, man, I'm kind of you know the, the fortunately the fishing's gotten good enough to where I can kind of play the weather, and um, we had a phenomenal trip today. Um, really, really good trip today, and the, you know some of the areas that I've been catching fish, you know, prior to the to the weekend. But uh, the fun thing about it today was the fish were really starting to gather up and school better. And um, and, and as Patrick will tell you, man, you know that makes our job a lot easier because you find the fish and you can really catch a bunch of them. Mm-hmm. You know, before there was like you know a stop was a two or three fish stop or you know or something like this, but now it's getting to be more like a you know like today we had several twelve and fifteen. Uh, fish stops making some really long drifts um you know and so that that's been the fun part and and, you know getting back to the wind direction you know fortunately there's fish you know most of the way up the bay and then there's when the weather's right there's a a lot of redfish out of the mouth of the bay and even if the wind blows hard there's still red i mean a trout in the uh, the rivers and then if you get around in the sound when you start getting some of the north and in easterly direction winds um there's fish down there so it's good enough right now that you know kind of depending on what the weather does uh you can you can fish an area or kind of fish a pattern and still have a really good day you know bobby you know i've been to your seminars and you and i've been friends for a while and we you've always talked a lot about utilizing that wind to your advantage and and i find myself doing that more and more to where not necessarily getting out of the wind, but just using it to help you cover water. And I'm, I'm so used to it now to where if I get in a situation where the wind's not blowing a little bit, I'm almost kind of like looking around, waiting on a breeze to start helping move the boat. Are you, you feel the same way on that? <laughs> exactly, man. That's exactly right. You know, uh, we left this morning. Or I was waiting on the charter to show up this morning, and the wind it was mirror slick. I was like, oh, gosh, man, what I want to do is not going to really work well with no wind. So it's gotten to the point now, just exactly, man, you laid it out exactly right. I want some wind uh, mm-hmm. now. I want some, you know, within reason. But even if, even when you get it, and you, and you really, this time of year, if you're going to fish in the spring, uh, you better count on it being windy. You know what I'm saying? So you better learn how to deal with it. And, you know, and, and that's one of the things I've done is I've over the years, instead of saying, oh, it's too windy to fish, you got to go out there and fish in it. If you're going to fish in it, you got to figure out how to use it to your advantage. And that's what I've done. And so it's funny you say that. I, I want some wind, you know, uh, I, you know, double digit wind doesn't scare me a bit and you play it right. You know, you really have to look at, 
you know, the geography of the area that you're planning on fishing or, or sometimes where the wind tells you're going to have to fish. And, and again, to my point, what I was mentioning before is, you know, we've gotten to the point. So in, in this spring to where there's enough fish to where you can look at wind directions and plan your day and still go out and have a great trip. Did you guys um, see any changes with all that fresh water, with all the rain we had over the weekend and into last week? Not really. Um, there's, I think there's a rise, and I think we're going to start to see some uh, water coming down the bay. Uh, th- those, the, the rains we get locally screw up the local rivers just for a couple days. But we're, we're on such a big tide cycle right now to where it, it doesn't take long at all for, the, for even, even the local rivers to clear up. And those drain out into the bay, and, and our bay flushes really well. So there's always plenty of clear water. So the local stuff doesn't really screw it up. It's really the volume of rain that comes down through the delta that screws up the center part of the bay. Sure. And from what I've seen so far, it's not going to be enough to screw anything up here for the next week. Yep, that makes sense. Uh, you guys seeing the, the spring pattern, the popping cork, voodoo shrimp? or That's it. Uh, dude, you hit the nail on the head right there. If you can get, you know, I, I don't, I love the topwater fish uh, and slick fish, slick lure fish uh, this time of year. But the, the what you run into when you start doing that, and Patrick, Patrick will tell you this, you, when you got three or four people on a boat, you, you don't need to be throwing plugs with three treble hooks. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, it's, it's bad I'm scared. I'm, hook. Yeah, I'm scared when one person has a treble hook plug on their on their line. That, yeah. That's especially when that one person is Rutland because he doesn't <laughs> care where he. If he if you're in his way, it doesn't matter. He's throwing, you know, and he throws kind of hard, so it's going to hurt when he hits you. But you start multiplying that by two or three, buddy, you're talking about some trouble. So anyway, but it's fun to catch fish on top water, and you can do it this time of year, particularly when you get around mullet. Works great. But what's worked for us, or what's worked for me right now, it's, it's all pop. Of course, I'm bringing everything. I'll have you know twelve or fourteen rods on the boat. But, you know, out of the, if I have 14 rods, 10 of them are going to have popping corks, mostly with voodoo on them. And I, I didn't, I had some bait today, but we literally never even opened up the live well today. We caught everything on artificial bait. And I think in my last, I, I can't, I'll have to look back, but I want to say in my last eight trips, I think I've used a total of two shrimp. You know, even though I've been carrying them, uh, it, it just hasn't been necessary because it's been, been, you've been able to stay on the go. The fish are biting, the water's clear, and that all really works well for artificial bait. Yeah, that's a good thing. I believe it. And, and the other thing, and Patrick will tell you this too, I'm sure, it, uh, dude, it never fails. You know, you, you get a lot of the bait shops that have kept bait all winter long, and just about the time you really start to need bait, which we're getting into right now, it get just evaporates. They just can't <laughs> find it, you know. So, so that's the other frustrating part. So you better have it figured out to where. Now, I'd hate to go. I'd hate to go sheephead fishing with artificial bait. Cause you're in for a long day doing that, but. You know, uh, as far as trout fishing goes and even red fishing, you're going to buy just fine with our fisher bait if you can't get live. That's right. Unless you're Captain Patrick Garmerson, he caught the state record sheep head on an artificial. State record sheep. On yeah, an artificial. On a gulp. No way. Are you kidding me? No. I'm dead serious. You're letting, that, you're letting the cat out of the bag, dude. Good for yep. you, man. Yep. We have, uh, I've already notified Berkeley, so just to let them know that they are, uh, they are the pending state record bait choice. Well, nice. Bobby, I was just looking at the rate or at the uh, at the weather for Saturday. You know, a lot of our listeners are going to be Saturday anglers, and we've got a forty percent chance of rain. And it looks like a southeast wind, possibly upwards of maybe heck, it might be a twenty mile an hour wind, but it looks Ooh. like about a ten to fifteen inland. In those type of conditions. How can uh, how can our listeners get out there and, and whack them a few trout this Saturday? Well, when you start getting any kind of south component in it, and, and, and there's fish even down at the lower end of the bay right now, my, my first thing, you know, again, to what we were just talking about a few minutes ago, my first thought when I start talking here in that kind of wind, I start thinking about going down all the way down to the island, you know, and um, fishing you get on the inside of the island, uh dolphin island bay area um even maybe possibly even down towards the west end and you get protection from that south and southeast wind even on a you know a big double digit wind like that you can go out there and catch fish the places you want to avoid are the west side of mobile bay you know the the open water areas like the shoals and 
in uh, you know in Portersville and some of those kind of places. Those go really really bad. We start talking about that kind of wind. So my I'm supposed to fish on Saturday. That's where I'm going to be. I'm going to be probably working my way down towards the island. You know, and if I have to, I'll stay up in the rivers or even get up in the creeks where we, you know, if it gets bad enough and I just totally have to give up on the trout. Uh, with that kind of wind, you're going to talk about high water levels too. So that'll let you get back in some of those little bitty creeks sometimes and, and get back in there and catch some of those trip saver redfish, you know. So that, that's probably what I'd do. Um, that's right. probably what I'll be doing if, it, if, if, that, if that forecast holds true. Right. Yeah. I mean, these, these forecasts change day to day, but I just wanted to kind of throw that out there to where we can start thinking about the weekend. Definitely and the good thing about it, at least with the, at least with the southeast wind, it keeps a lot of that area. The water stays really clear down there. When it goes more like west or southwest, that's when you you really start losing your water clarity, and which to me makes it that much tougher. You know, so at least if it keeps that east in it, uh, you're going to be able to find some decent water down at the lower end of the bay. All right, okay. Captain Bobby, cool. we found a personalized hate cap question for you because I know you I know you kind of like to nerd out on <laughs> on this stuff with speckled trout. <laughs> Uh, Man, yeah, and that's a good thing. I, I, I've, uh, I've, and and you know what? I've never called it. I've never heard it called nerded out, but I've heard <laughs> I've heard say like I I actually over. I was thinking more like I've been called that. I, I tend to overthink things a little bit when it comes to trout fishing. I've talked. I've, I've uh, heard that I, I theorize too much. I've never heard nerded out, but unfortunately, <laughs> I can't disagree with you because I do nerd out when it comes to this kind of stuff. Okay. I'm the kid where if there was a if there was a guy talking about the science of speckled trout, I'm the guy that's sitting in the front row in the center of the classroom with a uh, with a pocket protector and glasses on. <laughs> For sure, I like it. All right, well, Pat Hoffman emailed us at Alabama at Best Fishing Report. Dot com and he will be the recipient of the Fair Hope Rattle this week. Make sure you uh, redeem that. Email us again, Pat. Pat Hoffman says, is there an ideal salinity level for specs on the Gulf Coast? I know that's kind of broad. I know this is a great topic for this this time of year, so I'm just going to let you guys talk about it. Well, you know, as far as ideal goes, uh, I guess you could start out, they have to have five parts per thousand just to live. So, you, you know, you got to make sure you're above that. To put it in perspective, you're talking pretty much just – uh, just milky fresh water, like rainwater. There, they just can't live in that. They have to. They don't want spawn in anything less than fifteen parts per thousand. Give you an idea on that. That's kind of like typical summertime or, or late spring bay water. That's where you're seeing some, you know, a little bit of foam in your wake. And just to give you another idea, like thirty-five parts per thousand is blue water. That's the stuff bush and nip fish in. You know what I'm saying? So that okay. that'll kind of give you the different ranges. So. 15 parts per thousand is what they, they won't spawn anything less than that. So it kind of depends on the time of the year. Um, like right now, you're going to want to be in that 15 to 20 parts per thousand uh, salinity levels. Uh, it, that's where you're going to be around the fish that are in this spawning mode right now. You know, I wish I had the way you can get an hygrometer that'll actually read salinity. But, you know, my, my barometer for it is, how much foam's in the wake of the boat, you know? And uh, so I look back a lot of times just to make sure I got, I got foam in the wake. The other thing you can do, sometimes you can just ask the bait shops, you know, what's the, they read it because they have to keep the bait alive. True. You, you know, you can ask them what the salinity levels are. So, you know, kind of a long answer question. It's not really an ideal, uh, an ideal salinity level. Um, I would say, you know, uh, you know, you know, typically the fish you catch during the spring and the summer and the early part of the fall, you're fishing 20, roughly about 20 parts per thousand. But when you start getting up in the Delta later in the winter, where you're dealing with a big mix of fresh and salt water, you might be fishing 10 parts per thousand, but those are post-spawn fish. They're not worried about spawning. And that's the reason you can still catch those fish in those kind of salinity levels. So uh, I don't know if I answered this question, but that's about, that's everything I know about salinity and trout in about three minutes. That's much more than I know, so I appreciated that lesson for sure. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's all good stuff, Bobby. And I, I'd have to say that, you know, the difficult part, you know, a guy like me who I, I do a lot of river fish, do a lot of like Mobile River and I'll fish Theodore Canal. And there's a lot of times in the springtime of the year when the water will be totally fresh on top and yet the fish are in spawn mode down you know down possibly 10 15 20 feet deep because the water temperature is right the salinity is right but you don't get to see that foam in the water 
So anyway, that, that's a great point too, you know, and, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, like I was talking about, I'm looking for stuff, this, but you know, deep water guys are guys that are really good at deep water. Like you are, man, that's, that's a good point there because there is a level of salinity down deep and it may look terrible on the top, but it could be perfect. You know, like you said, 10, 12, 15 feet down. If you're fishing a 20 foot water column, you might be actually having your bait down there and, 20 parts per thousand uh, salinity, you know, so you can't give up on it just because it's muddy on the surface, man. So that's a great point that you bring up there. For sure. Thanks, Pat Hoffman, for that hey cap question, and we'll get you that fair hope rattle. All right, Captain Bobby, we appreciate you being on and keep whacking them. You are welcome, man. I appreciate y'all having me. So let's move on down to Orange Beach, Alabama, and hear from Dusty Hayes. What you got going on with us this week, uh, Dusty? All right, what's up, guys? We've been catching a lot of fish off the beach, a lot of pompano, too. Um, I've seen almost everybody that I know, you know, uh, local guys and, and tourists and friends and people I've met, and uh, Matthew and a bunch of other people catching pompano off the beach right now. You know, whether it's one or ten, you know, some days it's I caught 16 on Friday. A lot of them are undersized. And then we've caught some, you know, some mornings there's just a few keepers. Uh, but there definitely are good numbers out there. Uh, the guys further to the west are catching some good size pompano, like down Fort Morgan, and also catching sheepshead on some of the structure side down there, uh, and redfish and black drum as well. And then in the Orange Beach area, uh, we're catching a lot of mainly just pompano, but there has been the you know scraggler redfish or black drum, or uh, and even some nice whiting. Uh, whiting aren't really huge numbers, but there's always this time of year when the pompano running is always one or two kind of mix in in the crowd and they're you know great table fare and, and hard fighting you can catch them on basically the same tackle that you can for pompano but yeah the pompano body has been good we've been looking for incoming tides and in, which has been in the mornings uh, for the past few weeks incoming tides in clear water uh, it doesn't have to be like very 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 clear uh, there's a point to me where it's almost too clear uh, but that green color is really critical. You know, that brown mud water from all the rain and stuff we've had recently, uh, they, you can catch some in that, but not as much. It seems like they don't really like that lower salinity. They like that high salinity, clean Gulf water. Uh, and so that's really what I look for. You know, you might have to find look two or three beaches before you really find what you want. And it'll move through, too, especially with the wind switching from north to south or southwest to southeast. You know, you'll have brown water, but an hour later it might be perfect, uh, pretty green water. So, mm -hmm. so they uh, still eating up the fish bites. Yeah, fish bites has been doing real well. Um, I'm a shrimp person, but as it gets into spring, starting now, the sand flea uh, fish bites seems to be king pretty much from here till fall. Uh, and you can still catch them on shrimp. And everybody you talk to has different preferences. Like I have a buddy of mine I've been fishing with for years, and he fishes in Gulf Shores majority of the time, and he loves the the lime green chartreuse colored fish bites and the shrimp flavor that's his go-to so you know with, with the fish bites the two and the color a lot of it's just water temperature i mean not water temperature water clarity and also sure. experimenting you know on what you like there's really no one color that works we use so many different colored floats and beads from purples to uh, uh yellows to pinks and rainbow and you name it and like this morning uh the book my buddy i was just telling you about he was beside me fishing and he had one rod using black floats that was getting smoked every <laughs> two minutes. And no other rod out of eight rods was even getting touched. Interesting. Might you be know, something it, to that. Yeah. You know, uh, and I told him, I was like, you know, I can't name anything off the top of my head that's black, but walk up and down the <laughs> beach and look how many things you can find that are black. You right. know, right there on the shoreline, little shells and stuff. So something they're eating is is uh, close to that color, apparently. But oh, yeah, experimenting is, is, is a huge part uh, of spring nothing stays the same it's day by day you can you can have your stuff going on and you think you got it going and it'll swap on you the next day so basically every day is a new clean slate and you got to start at scratch but uh there's a lot of fish out there there's a lot of good size fish especially coming from the east guys fishing further to the east been catching a lot of good fish uh, me and matthew went yesterday and he got a real solid fish and then our buddy that was out there beside us he had three of them you know all around three pounds so real Man, fat there's... fish right now that's some big pompano right there. Hey, yeah, there's a, um, there's a bunch of them coming through 18 to 20 inches in that area. Dusty, I've got a question. Um, I'm not a not a big beach fisherman, pompano fisherman, do occasionally, but run across uh, over the years, there's 
pompano jigs, little dusters. Uh, is that something that, that anybody uses? I mean, are y'all using those things at all? I hear a lot of these bottom rigs and stuff like that. Uh, is that something worth even experimenting with? Yeah, so with me, and this is just my personal experience, somebody else might tell you completely different. Um, like if I have an inshore charter and I'm on the boat and I'm fishing Perdido Pass on the rocks and stuff like that, I always have a pompano jig. Pretty much from January to May, I'll have a pompano jig on a rod, and they work great. It seems okay. like on the beach, I've never caught a pompano on a pompano jig. I've caught mm-hmm. flounder and redfish and Spanish mackerel and ladyfish and you name it. I've never actually caught a pompano on the beach on a jig. I've caught tons off the jetties and stuff on pompano jigs. Now, there are there are guys that walk the beach and, and catch them, you know, just blind cast them for them. And I know a little further to the east, there's a lot of guys that sight fish for them. You know, they'll walk and they'll see them flash and do that. And also, too, on the pier, it seems like the, the jig's really critical. Uh, you can go out there early, early season when they're coming through and you're not necessarily catching them on bait. But there's guys catching them on jigs on the pier, and especially in the bar and even the Gulf State Pier at times when the water's clear. It's not something that I necessarily, you know, put on my arsenal. Uh, I use jigs a lot this time, almost all year, but I actually use yellowtail jigs. So down in the Keys, you know, people fish the patch reefs and they use live shrimp and chum up the yellowtail snapper and all that stuff. And you can get a little yellowtail jig and it's just like a weighted hook, basically. Like mine are, I think, an eighth ounce and they're just a real heavy stout hook, real short. And you can get different colors. They make pink and yellow and white. And I'll put a little piece of fish bites on there. And I use a real light, you know, eight and a half foot steelhead rod with that little piece of fish bite. So sometimes even a little piece of shrimp and I'll throw it out, you know, five yards it's not going to go very far because it weighs basically nothing throw it out five yards on a real calm day and just let it drift with the current and the waves and you'll catch pompano and whiting and flounder and redfish i mean all the time on that is very very deadly technique especially in the fall um and it's also something i use sight fishing you know we see a lot of on the clear days you'll see redfish and black drum and chief's head just cruising up and down the beach and you know if you chunk a two drop rig out there in front of them with a two ounce sinker you're just going to spook them off mm-hmm. so that's something that throws basically no no noise when you throw it in front of them you can lead it lead them you know 10 15 feet it'll sink right in front of their face and they just can't resist it because it's very small i mean the whole thing's the size of a nickel maybe and uh, something very small compact natural looking and uh they just they can't stand it they love it sweet i, I know like you it. do uh inshore charters over there too on that uh east side over there orange beach area one on inshore side over there uh the inshore's actually heated up pretty good starting last week you know we were just catching fish but it was just inconsistent uh but now it's, it's picked up pretty good there's still some sheep set on the jet uh on the jetties at Perdido pass uh, a lot of good size ones and then also there's been the scraggly redfish and a lot of pompano out there as well if you don't want to fish the jetties and fight all the crowds out there and uh, all that stuff you can go inshore the trout starting to move out of the creeks and uh, make their way out to the gulf and in the bigger parts of the bay fishing you know a lot of the stumps and stuff around some of the back bays in deeper docks have been good for trout redfish and sheep's head uh when you get into um you know here in the next few weeks as that water temp rises your trout start getting on the grass flats and uh there's been a few fish on some of the flats already uh but not a whole lot i have seen some though and even um some guys starting to dock like fish too and catching fish so uh, we've, awesome. we've been heating up over here inshore and, uh, the redfish bite's been good on a lot of the docks, especially the deep ones. If you can find one eight to 12 foot of water, there's going to be fish on it for sure. So, um, it's, it's getting better day by day over here. That seems to be the consensus all around Captain Dusty. And I like to hear that, man. You know, we like to get that tip from you each week. This week's onshore tip is brought to us by our local Geico insurance office. Everybody knows Geico has great auto rates, but did you know they also have great rates on boats, ATVs, motorcycles, and personal watercrafts? Give Ron Davis a call at 251-445-0053. Did you know Geico does even more than insure your valuable, valuable items? They also offer on the water services like towing, battery jumps, gas delivery, and you can save by bundling these services with your insurance. Call Ron Davis, Geico agent, or visit him online at geico.com forward slash mobile dash AL. What you think for a tip this week, Captain Dusty? Yeah, man. Uh, so I think uh, my best tip I can give you for springtime this week, pumping up fishing, especially early season before it just gets absolutely crazy, uh, is just make sure you keep everything simple. I'm sure it's been touch base before, but when you're surf fishing, uh, especially when you find that clear water, like I was talking about earlier, you don't want heavy tackle. You know, I use real light rods, uh, rods 
depending on the surf days. You know, if I'm a day like yesterday where we had huge waves, I was using 10 foot rods and three and four ounce sinkers, which you can do on rough days. But when you get calmer days like this morning, you know, we're using eight to nine foot rods and one and two ounce sinkers, 4,000 size reel, 15, 20 pound braid, uh, just real light stuff. And then you can downsize your leader from 20 is about the heaviest I'll go pompano fishing. And if it gets really calm and clear, you can bump it all the way down to, you know, I know guys that do 10 and 12. I usually go to 15 on my light side, 15 pound leader, smaller hooks, and that'll get you more bites. Uh, it's not going to be as so heavy duty sitting out there. It's not as much for them to see. The less tackle you have on that rig, the better. You know, smaller swivels. I, I prefer not to use a swivel at the bottom to connect my weight. I just use a loop knot. Um, and, and smaller hooks, you can do smaller beads, smaller floats. You know, just real finesse. And you, you'll notice you'll get a lot more bites, uh, especially on the tougher days. Um, you can downsize and, and, and make the difference in the world. And another thing is, too, is experiment with um, – fluorocarbon versus monofilament i'll mm. do if i'm fishing four rods i'll do two of each and you know fluorocarbon is all fancy and supposed to be the best of the best and all that stuff and there's times where it really does make a difference it's like you can't catch fish on anything but fluorocarbon uh but there's also times when that water's a little dingier you know that monofilament floats unlike fluorocarbon fluorocarbon will sink and lay on the bottom that monofilament will float up a little bit and kind of give your rig a little more life in the surf Mm -hmm. and um it also has a stretch on there as well so um, i always experiment you know i go back and forth and try different colors and, and just every day is a new thing same thing with going down the lighter leader and, and whether it be mono or fluorocarbon always try it out and you know see one might be doing better than the other heck yeah that's how you that's how you figure but, it out that's a good tip about the uh mono versus fluorocarbon yeah I like you know, it. a lot of people are always dead set that they're going to use fluorocarbon leader but i mean you've just you just made a good point as to why there there's a reason to experiment with both so appreciate that tip there For buddy sure. you know a lot of people just really overlook monofilament you know they think it's the four like you're saying people are just dead set on fluorocarbon and it works great at times you know especially trout fishing sometimes uh in clear water live baits and stuff like that but you know monofilament will, will definitely get the job done a lot of times if chris fetch can catch trout on 40 pounds monofilament you know anybody anybody can catch fish on 20 pound monofilament that's so, right uh, all right man we so, appreciate um, the report if people want to book a trip with you how they get in touch with you uh, you can call me at 678-897-0167 all right captain dusty we appreciate it man keep whacking and we'll talk to you soon thanks dusty. all right buddy see y'all all right, Captain Patrick, we have a special guest today. We have Mr. Rick Frederick with the Mobile Bay National Estuary Program. How are you doing today, Mr. Rick? I'm doing great. How are you guys? We're doing well, man. We've been talking about the nice weather. It makes me want to, I'm, I'm going to have to go for a boat ride this evening when we wrap this thing up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think it's here. Uh, spring, is, spring is finally made it here. That seems to be the consensus on the whole show today. Finally. See, that's right. Beautiful weather we've had. So you guys have something coming up here that uh, we, we need some help with, correct? Yeah, we've got an event coming up uh, next weekend that we're looking for volunteers. And uh, it's a coordinated effort between our program, the Mobile Bay National Estuary Program, and the state of Alabama's Marine Resources Division, and also NOAA, uh, their Marine Debris Program as well, are the three uh, organizations putting this event on. And it's for the uh, derelict crab trap cleanup that we do usually about once a year or really as needed. Okay, so that's going to be on this Saturday? It's actually next week. It's uh, it's actually on Friday, uh, April 19th, and Saturday, April the 20th. Perfect. Okay. And both days, the event starts at 830. Uh, it's going to take place. The staging area is the Chocolata Bay boat ramp right there on the causeway next to uh, Ralph and Taku's uh, restaurant. Right. And what we're look, we've got uh, two opp several opportunities for volunteers. The first day on Friday, uh, we're looking for kayakers are going to be needed to go out and mark the derelict crab traps. And this all takes kind of place in the shallow flats up near the upper part of the bay, right across from the battleship. So that's that's what's needed on Friday, and then on Saturday will be the main cleanup day where we'll need you know smaller shallow draft uh, vessels. Uh, to go collect the traps and then deliver them back to the disposable site there at the boat ramp. Um, so we need boat owners out to help us with that. And also there's opportunities for uh, volunteers that, that maybe don't own a boat. You can help on shore by moving the traps from the boats uh, into the dumpster 
And then sometimes some of the boat owners need, need, need a hand on, you know, deck to help out as well. So there's kind of a lot of opportunity for different people. Sure. Okay. So say I own a boat um, and I want to be involved. What's my next step? Just kind of walk me through what I would do if I owned a boat and I wanted to be involved. Yeah. If you don't mind. The main contact, if you do want to participate, we ask that you talk with a, a gentleman named Jason Herman, who's with the Alabama Marine Resources Division. And his phone number is 251-861-2882. Or you can also email him and it's Jason dot. And Herman is with two R's and two N's, H-E-R-R-M-A-N-N at dcnr.alabama.gov. And uh, Jason can get you signed up and ready to go. But again, it's right there at the Chocolata Bay boat ramp is where the volunteer meeting, you know, where everybody will meet uh, that morning. If weather is an issue with getting out there and doing this, um, do you have a alternate date? And uh, what would be the plan there? And then right. also, what's the importance of getting these traps out of the water? Sure. Well, as far as an alternate date, I have not seen one uh, um, announced yet. So as we get closer to it, there may be some information there. So the uh, alabamaoutdoor.com is some a uh, website you can go to for that information. We have had kind of tough weather the last couple of years, but sometimes the wind and the tides are not kind to us but we've still been able to get out there and get uh get what we can because you know it's all right there right near the causeway so it's not uh it's fairly easy to get to so you know in these traps uh over time they just they wear out and people leave them out there and so hey they're an eyesore but they also break up and the materials get in the water and another problem we have is we don't want traps out there that are still catching fish and catching crabs and they're not being harvested so um, you know, we just need to get these out of there when they've, when they've been out there. And, you know, sometimes they've been out there for a year not being used. So, uh, we just, you know, we need to get those out of the water, uh, and, you know, other boats can run over them and those type things. So there's several reasons to get them out of there. Certainly. Also, Mr. Thank Rick, you. we appreciate you being on the show and thanks for putting this together. You bet. And hopefully we'll get some volunteers. Fantastic. We hope to see everybody out there, uh, next Saturday and Obviously. Friday. Yep. Take care. All right. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Man, that was good stuff with uh, Mr. Frederick there uh, with the uh, Mobile Bay National Estuary Program. Yeah, if you, you guys know, can be a part of that, getting, you may as well. Yeah, I mean, if you're not if you're not out there fishing and you got a got a few minutes to where you can go down there and give them some support, man, that's a uh, that's a good thing for the for the area keeping uh, keeping those crab traps out of the water that are going to be continuously killing other crabs and and fish and stuff like that so it's anytime we can help uh clean up our our resource here i'm all about it for sure well good show man what'd you learn today you learn anything in particular anything stick out to you so i had two things stick out to me and one was i i just have to concur with with angelo talking about being ready having you know having just you know one rod dedicated to Hey, pitching a bait at this particular, you know, a cruiser fish, something, you know, like a dolphin, like he said, yeah. or having that one rod, that one bait rigged up, ready to go for that blue marlin if it shows up. Man, Not going to show up in Mobile Bay, that's right. but that's right. I can relate because in the summertime, if I have that one rod ready to go for like throwing a bait at a triple tail, if I come come by one, oh, yeah. or maybe a school of bull reds, if I've got that one rod or two rods ready to go, you know that that kind of thing can really help elevate the the success and the the overall quality of a fishing trip. Yeah, um, can make make but, your whole trip. Yeah, I mean it really can. And, and but the one thing that I learned today that you know is I, I've become really a uh, a fluorocarbon snob, if you will. Mm-hmm. I think a lot um, of folks are like that as well. Yeah, so I I have completely bought into the whole fluorocarbon being nearly invisible to the fish underwater. So I'm like dead set. Fluorocarbon is my leader material. But he brings up a good point as to why there's a reason to you know experiment with some uh, monofilament because the monofilament's going to float in the water and possibly give a different presentation to his bait, especially in a surf condition where it might be getting tossed around a little bit, you know, whereas the fluorocarbon is heavier and it's going to get on the bottom and stay on the bottom. So for sure, I would have to say that was a good learning point for me this this show. I like that a lot too as well. (laughs) I can also say 
you have never seen a fire drill like a blue marlin coming up to the back of the boat and not having a bait ready or a rod ready for that. Oh, I bet it's ugly. I got it on video somewhere. <laughs> One of the last trips that we went on, or the, that I went on with all my friends offshore, we were uh, kite fishing about a 200 pound blue marlin. It was chasing a mahi mahi about probably about a foot long, and I thought it was going to tear off the back of the boat. That fish was lit up, son. He had his pecs all bowed up, and he was chasing mm. that fish all up under the escape and all. And, of course, everybody's trying to video the fish, and I'm trying to find a bait. I think I ended up yeah. swimming in a live well trying to find a hardtail. It was a nightmare, but it was cool to see that fish. Uh, we actually ended up getting it on a getting it on, getting a hardtail on a hook, and I just found the first hook that I found. I hooked it, and I threw it over, and it just happened to be the one that the bird was on with my Islander, and so I had too much hardware, and it was a nightmare. But anyways, so, that's a story for another day. But So the story is that you didn't land the fish? We did not. It hit, okay. it hit one time, took a little bit of a took a little bit of the bait and then spit it. It just had too much oh. on it. We just weren't ready. But I mean we were kite fishing. We weren't that's ready. Fr- Angelo's tip frust- would have been that's, uh, frust- that's just frustrating for me to have to hear that. It was tough. <laughs> it was tough for sure. So what else do we have going on, Butch? We have the uh Floor Bama rodeo coming up, right? That's correct. Yeah. Joe and I are gonna be there. The sixth annual Floor Bama fishing rodeo. It's May thirty one through June second. It's a ton of categories, uh, blue crab, speckled trout, red snapper, swordfish. Uh, you guys check them out. Get your tickets at floribamafishingrodeo.com. But i tell you what, that Floribama Rodeo, that's a pretty cool, that's a pretty cool event. We've, uh, I think my wife and I placed in blue crab, or no, my son placed in blue crab <laughs> and we've in redfish. Anyway, it's been a couple of years since my schedule aligned for me to be able to fish that thing. But if I'm, I, I need to take a look at my calendar, see if I can fit that thing in because it's a, it's definitely a fun event. For sure, I'm looking forward to it. Joe and I are staying over there that week and bringing our wives and kind of making a little vacation of it. So we're oh, listen it. at you, man. Yeah, yep. take a little break, ladies, man. So yeah. tell us, um, we had a uh, we had a, a giveaway going right. on on Facebook. Tell me about that. We, we did won it. Mr. John Dixon was the winner of that giveaway. Make sure you email us, Mr. John Dixon, at Alabama at bestfishingreport.com. I'll get you that uh, dry fit Alabama saltwater fishing report shirt, um, a couple koozies, and some stickers. We appreciate that. Appreciate all nice. you guys that shared and liked our stuff. Yeah. We get a bunch of response out of that? We did. It was good. Yep. Good. Good. Well, we appreciate everybody listening. And, uh, man, I get, I get so much feedback from people just messaging me through, uh, through Facebook or, or direct, just sending me emails or, or text messages or whatever, just really appreciating this stuff. And, and, you know, I really appreciate y'all, you know, it's, it's a really big deal that I get to be involved in this because it's, you know, as much as I love to fish, I, I mean, it's, it's almost as fun just to talk fishing as it is to be involved in fishing. Anyway, I wanted to give a shout out to our buddy, um, Donley Weaver. He's from, uh, Southwest Pennsylvania gave me a call the other day to, uh, to tell me how much he appreciated the show. Uh, Mr. Donley gets out once a year, gets down to, um, where do you say he get? He goes once a year down to Florida but he said it just, just the show in general, just, he loves listening to the show and, and we appreciate you, sir. Absolutely. And, uh, we appreciate all of our listeners yep. and, uh, look forward to, uh, look forward to the next show, Butch. Absolutely. You guys make sure you, uh, go over to iTunes and give us a rate and a review there. And, uh, that's going to wrap up this show. You guys head on over to greatdaysoutdoors.com forward slash ASFR if you want us to email you the new show each week. You guys keep whacking and we'll talk to you soon. This week's Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report has been brought to you by Coastal Conservation Association of Alabama. Check them out at ccaalabama.org. Also brought to you by GEICO. Call Ron Davis, GEICO agent at 251-445-0053 or visit him online at geico.com slash mobile dash AL. And also A Team Fishing Adventures. Check them out online at www.ateamfishing.com or contact them at 251 661 7696. 
And also, Great Days Outdoors, the South's finest hunting and fishing magazine. Pick up your copy wherever magazines are sold or check them out at greatdaysoutdoors.com. And also, Killer Doc. Are you suffering from doc dysfunction? Check out the full line of doc enhancement at killerdoc.com. That's killerdoc.com. Also, Ugly Fishing Charters with Captain Patrick Armisen. You can check us out at uh, uglyfishing.com or call us at 251-747-1554.